So implementing COT systems, is agility even possible? Today, briefly, we're gonna talk through why we're here. We probably all have a pretty good idea of that, but we'll discuss it briefly. What are COT systems? Um, and again, you're here probably because you're familiar with them, but I wanna make sure that we have shared understanding of what that looks like. In general terms, with some common examples you may already use and not even think of as COT systems, why they need to be customized, and then again, this is about cut systems in the context of agile and agility. And so just a, a brief sort of inflection point there to make sure that we're aligning to those values. And then some key considerations for both evaluation and implementation. And here's the about me. Any chance I get to use Scrabble tiles, I will use them unapologetically. So I'm uh, proud to be the director of Agile Consulting here at Lightspeed. I'm a trainer and an Agile coach. Um, I've been in the technology world uh, you know, far too long probably, but for over 25 years throughout all aspects of the SDLC. So uh, development, project management, operations, you name it. Um, so I've, I've got a pretty good idea, I believe, of, of sort of all of the different areas of the ecosystem in the SDLC, and that helps inform what we'll talk about today. Also about this is 15 plus years in senior leadership roles, vice president, senior vice president, CIO, CTO. Um, and why that may matter a little bit is as part of that, I've oversaw and led uh, successful implementations or material updates of nearly a dozen cut systems in financial insurance and other industries. So why are we here? Well, the foundation of this conversation actually started with a question from one of our clients who was asking whether it was practical when we talked about what their transformation uh, was going to include as far as moving from proprietary apps to, off the to uh, commercial off the shelf systems, whether it was even possible to approach this in an agile way. And so I wanna debunk that myth that this is not compatible with our agile philosophy and our approaches. Oops. And then also to provide some simple techniques to ensure agility in implementing these systems. So this may go without saying, but what are cut systems, commercial off the shelf systems? I'm sure that you all are here because you have some understanding of what that is. I'll just add a little bit more so there's shared understanding. So classifications of cut systems, others will break this into smaller groups, but to me, there's really two options. Uh, that we will talk about. One, which are systems that are closed, they're off the shelf systems. I think of the office suite as an example. It's generally configurable in some cases and you have people doing things like VBA, but for the most part, people don't buy those systems and expect to do massive configuration or custom development on them. And then there's open systems. Uh, these are systems that are designed in their technology where material changes can be made through code and configuration to support unique organizational needs. And today's discussion is gonna be about open cut systems. So to help sort of inform what the, the different variety of these systems are, and this is by far not an exhaustive list, but some things you may already use and not think of this way, Microsoft Dynamics, SAP, which we'll actually talk about a little bit more in terms of their implementation model. Salesforce, almost everyone is familiar with Salesforce. Oracle financials, uh, et cetera. The Oracle platform and a number of their products are COTS platforms that can be highly configured and customized. ServiceNow uh, for IT service management is a standard in many organizations, can, is very much a, a COTS system that can be highly configured and customized. And then almost everybody on the planet, uh, knowingly or otherwise, has used SharePoint. And you may actually use some applications that use SharePoint as the foundation of the technology, and you may not even know that it's SharePoint. So it's COTS. These are commercial off-the-shelf systems. Why would we have to customize? Well, these systems and the ones that we're really talking about, uh, as far as these large platforms that organizations implement, they offer genericized or simplified features and products out of the box. But these out of the box features and capabilities with no customization generally aren't usable for most organizations. Um, your organization is likely to have specialized business specific requirements, including things like unique workflows, specialized products or services, or streamlined or more sophisticated user interfaces, user journeys, goals, and experiences. 
So in general, these systems will give you a good starting point, but generally you will need to, and by definition, that's why these are open cut systems. There will work, there will need to be substantial work done to meet your unique organizational needs. There's also integrations with third-party providers and platforms that are often part of these integrations. So I had mentioned in the uh, agenda, pause for a moment, what is agile, what is agility? When we talk about agility and implementing these systems, just wanna pause and make sure that we're aligning what that looks like framework agnostic to our principles, to our philosophy, to the values that agile provides to us and that'll inform how we talk further as far as how we evaluate and implement these systems. So what agility means at the highest level to me, I hope there's no debate here. If there is, please throw it in the chat. But the, the things that are really important when looking at implementing these systems in our approach, regardless, as I said, of framework, methodology, technology, et cetera, we need to make sure that we're customer and value focused. Part of that is making sure, well, a key part of that is making sure that we're providing quantifiable business value, that we're adaptable to changes that emerge, that we're working collaboratively as a team, that we're engaging our customers and we're getting their feedback and we're incorporating that feedback continuously, iteratively to improve our products and services. We're delivering early and often. We're enabling predictability and consistency in our throughput and that we have built-in quality. These are the things that we want to make sure we don't lose when we approach implementing these systems. And th these are the things that we all know uh, often are lost in the traditional waterfall-based approach, which is one of the reasons um, why we've moved to an agile approach across the board. So when we're moving forward with an agile approach, an agile mindset, there are some key differences that we need to be cognizant of and that we need to remember when we're considering and again, the, the theme that you'll see just sort of as a precursor uh, or foreshadowing is these uh, differences, a lot of them are really at the evaluation stage and we're still evaluating with agility, but there's some key differences that we need to keep in mind. First, the core platform needs to be sufficient for business needs and we need to do our homework here. This doesn't mean exhaustive requirements gathering, but does the system itself <clears throat> Excuse me, does the system itself have the capabilities and the functionality that we need at its core level that it'll support what our business model is? And that's an area that we need to make sure that it supports our core products, our services, and the capabilities that we need. The ability to customize effort, time, and expense. So, what I've seen in a number of environments. While we can do things as far as customizing these systems, in some cases, it ends up being more expensive because we have to override the existing platforms, features, and capabilities. That's problematic uh, in ways that we probably don't have enough time to go into, but not just in the implementation and the usage, but things like upgrades. The more that you customize, especially with custom code, uh, there'll be a tipping point where you're effectively writing proprietary applications that are not really founded on that other system. And, and the amount of ongoing rework is probably at least as much as what you'd have if you just wrote a proprietary platform itself. Integrations and third-party add-ins, which we'll talk about more both in evaluation and implementation, look at the ecosystem. Um, these Ecosystems vary by vendor, but mature ecosystems, I think of Atlassian as one good example that I really like. They've got a great ecosystem for different modules, plugins, capabilities, et cetera. But look at the ecosystem and see what can be extended that way. Related to that, configuration versus development. What can be configured versus what needs to be developed through code? If the more code you write, the more problematic it ends up being in the implementation. And again, in the, the, the care and feeding, the ongoing uh, support of that system, the more custom development, the more challenges you're likely to have. And then finally, when you're choosing a system, you're also not only marrying yourself to a vendor, but to their technical platforms. So uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're a .NET, you know, Microsoft shop, and you've got a platform that is Linux-based and a different database platform and uh, et cetera, a different code base, 
the there will be additional work that's required if you want to use your existing team members to get them migrated to the new platform. Not insurmountable, but it definitely should be part of the consideration. So the big picture with agility, this actually came from SAP and it is a good illustration from my perspective of some things that we can do. And this is, you can see sprints already in there and you can see these iterations. Um, but as far as that first phase, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, as far as things to consider, getting a baseline system up and running out of the box is really important. We want to get that in place first. Again, one of our principles, one of our, our key aspects of our philosophy as far as Agile is we want to get working software being the primary measure of progress, but also getting feedback early and often. So if we've already got a system, even if we know that it's not going to meet those business needs, getting users interacting with it as soon as possible is going to provide a great deal of value. This includes the core system, but also it, there can be accelerators, plugins, modules, whatever you call them. Uh, accelerators are referenced here, but these are really just existing, whether it's code, um, uh, applications, any other sort of guidance, templates, et cetera. There are other things that you can do to get a, a system out of the box and functioning very quickly and then start evaluating how it works and what you need to potentially change. So you're still going to change things, but this gets us short iterations very quickly, early versions of working software. And, and our users are not, and this is, again, irrespective of COP systems or proprietary development, the thing that we learned through Agile, right, is that users often won't know what they need until we show them something that is not what they need or want. That real interaction with real functioning software is invaluable. And one of the benefits of these systems, if we implement them properly, is we get that feedback far more quickly, at least on a bigger scale more quickly than we could with proprietary development because it's just got a, a better place to start from. So I've talked a lot about this and again, the foreshadowing, there's a lot of work in the evaluation phase, but please don't confuse or conflate it with extensive you know, traditional requirements gathering. There's just some different considerations that we need to make sure we do our homework on uh, and I'll, I'll, these will be items that I've discussed in high level in prior slides, but we'll talk about them a little bit more deeply here. So overall requirements gathering challenges. If you could throw in the chat, what makes requirements gathering more difficult with cuts than proprietary development? What assumptions do we have that we may need to re-examine or examine during implementing these systems? What's going to require more discovery and analysis and documentation than with proprietary development initiatives? What efforts can be lessened with COTS implementations as compared to proprietary development initiatives? And what techniques do we use today in our agile approaches that could be more helpful? So in the evaluation phase, we can do this with agility, but as we've mentioned, the evaluation process requires some additional focus and planning because as we've mentioned, the proprietary, app, unlike proprietary application development, if we've chosen a system and the issue is inadequate or missing core functionality, pivoting is a lot harder with off the shelf systems where we've made a multi-year and often tens or even more or millions of dollars worth of commitment. We're married to that decision for a while, or if we're not, it's gonna be very expensive to undo it. Here's some other things that are not always uh, thought of as much in depth. Consider non-functional requirements, especially if you're in a highly regulated industry, insurance, financial services, healthcare. Um, if this platform that you're looking at evaluating doesn't support your needs for things like security, uh, you know, compliance for PCI, uh, HIPAA, et cetera, those are gonna be effectively impossible to build in. Also things like performance and scalability, irrespective of uh, domain or industry, if you've got a system that is built for 100 users and you're trying to scale it to 10,000 users, it's gonna be very difficult to scale that in. So those are considerations from a non-functional requirements perspective to be cognizant of in your evaluation process. One of the things that we really want to, to reinforce though is 
a business value and capability focus documented in a prioritized MVP, MMP of what should be de developed. I'm sorry, of what a prioritized MVP or MMP, minimum marketable product, for those of you who are not yet familiar with that term, um, what should be developed to help ensure a holistic understanding of what's essential for that platform to do, to be, and to support. This slide is really busy. I apologize in advance. I, I promise I won't read you the entirety of it, but this is again to reinforce the order of operations in the evaluation phase of the things that are most efficient, effective, agile, and cost-effective. We wanna understand what core functionality is out of the box. We wanna know what's customizable via configuration. Configuration is key. These systems all support it, but how they do it changes uh, by system and some are much better than others. What integrations and add-ons, uh, add-ins, et cetera, or third-party tools coexist within that vendor ecosystem? Look for a mature ecosystem. What can be extended or modified via code and in what programming language? Um, uh, one of the last big uh, initiatives that I uh, was leading with my teams uh, used a proprietary language and it wasn't too much of a shift, but it definitely throttled things back a little bit until everyone became familiar with it. And almost everything was done in that proprietary language for that particular platform. So again, we want to start with configuration. That's always our preferred, uh, you know, in order of operations, that's always our preferred first step. Then third-party plugins, then integrations, and then custom development as always the last uh, tool of choice if all of the other options have been exhausted. Configuration, the one consideration here that um, I've also learned that I would ask in the evaluation process is who can do the configuration? It's great if you can configure stuff, does it need to be a developer that's configuring it? Can it be, does it need to be a technical analyst or can it be somebody with a business, both for efficiency and cost effectiveness, but also to limit those wherever possible, the levels of abstraction. If you have the person who truly understands the business processes, who is able to make these changes directly, that is invaluable. The more abstraction you have between different people explaining what they need, the more likely that there's a time increase that's bad, but also a misunderstanding. We're all familiar with that. That's why we have you know, collaborative cross-functional teams. As mentioned in the chat, these vendor ecosystems, this is, so this is a good option, but these add-ons can be very uh, beneficial and they're better than custom dev, but they generally have a price. And so that has to be par part of the consideration. Integrations, again, similar to these uh, provider or third-party plugins, they're generally at the API or data level. They can be great. Again, we, we want to do anything we can to get our users' needs met without having to do custom development. So if, if it can be through an integration, that is always preferable. And again, there will be some instances on almost all of these systems where custom development, writing actual code is required. We want this to be the last option always. And as uh, mentioned, the, the development is not only expensive in terms of financial cost, having developers do this work, but there's opportunity cost. De de there is just far more work to you know, understand the requirements, get them developed, and actually get them deployed and make sure they're not breaking or overriding other aspects of that functionality. So we want to use this as the last tool of choice and be cognizant of you know, what those potential impacts are and try to avoid them or mitigate them as much as is possible. In the RFP and RFI, some other things that I would really strongly suggest for those of you who are just starting on this journey right now, the 38% the of you who will be working on a solution soon, maybe some of the 25% of you who are actively working on that solution. These are things that I or organizations I've worked with have learned the hard way understand those foundational needs and strategic business goals and ensure the platform is able to support them. That should not be conflated with traditional monolithic hundreds and hundreds of pages of requirements documents. This is foundational needs and strategic business goals and make sure the platform can support them. This is really key. Verify a reference customer's time to pilot and to full production as well as the resourcing model empirically based on data on the real effort. What we found uh, with a number of vendors is there is a very optimistic timeline in terms of person hours and uh, the actual timeline in, in terms of, of calendar time 
of how that system can be implemented. And when we did reference calls in the RFP, you know, RFI process, found that the actual real world experience, and these are these are the contacts that the vendor gave us, gave us answers that were 2x to maybe 5x larger than what uh, was estimated. So empirical data, you know, that's one of our key, you know, principles looking at actual real data is key in this process. As part of that, another question is to ask them how much out of the box functionality and capabilities were highly customized. There should be a percentage of this conversation always is what is the percentage ratio on average um, of out of the box configuration versus customization. And uh, probably goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, a low ratio of out of the box functionality may indicate a disconnect with core business processes, practices, and needs. Now, your reference customer, you know, when, when uh, doing this in the insurance domain, there are different products, there's different types of insurance products that are available. So you have to obviously, when you're doing your homework, think about things that are understandable differences and maybe a particular reference customer has a different product line. And so there should be some variations. But if you talk with a couple, you'll start to notice some trends. But either way, look at the delta of the proposed timeline and implementation plan, not just calendar time, but again, person hours. They probably won't tell you how much they spent, but they might be willing to, and they were willing to tell us um, you know, what, what the total effort was in terms of person hours. And then you can do the calculations yourself of what the actual investment was. Some final considerations. Um, and this was alluded to in one of the chat messages, but remember that one of the often underappreciated values of these systems is that they've got these capabilities, um, not only capabilities, but they've got these foundational starting components within these capabilities for use, like built-in templates. Yes, you don't end there, but at least you've got a starting point, a lot better if you use those rather than writing code from scratch or starting to build a product from scratch in that platform. They've got products in many cases, if, if it's appropriate for that particular domain and platform that you can use as a starting point. Workflows, and this one is really key, at least from my experience, and it was alluded to in the, the chat as well about changing to the vendor's process. Um, there's some instances where you'll be forced to change to their process and that's bad. But one of the learnings that we had was that their vendor process um, sorry, I'll talk about reporting that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about workflow specifically, but reporting dashboards and analytics, again, what they have out of the box may be useful um, as is in many cases, you'll configure it, but you've got a really good starting point. So start with what's already available, even if you have to customize or even, <clears throat> excuse me, customize through code, it, this gives you a great starting point and can get working software out more quickly. But all of these, and this was the point about workflow specifically, but applies to all, all of these have been iteratively improved by many years of development based on many customers' needs in that domain. Whether your organization can use that out-of-box functionality as it is or not, or at least as a starting point, it may be more effective for your organization to customize, and this is especially the case with workflow, but I think, <coughs> excuse me, it, it applies to other aspects as well. What is out of the box isn't just generic. In many cases, it's been improved iteratively through all of these different customers, through all of these versions of that product. Don't immediately change that system to match your current processes, your current reports, your current products. Take a look and see what they've got and see if that actually may be part of the evolution of your organization. So you're not just recreating processes, practices, workflows from decades ago in some cases. And then understand that vendor ecosystem and extensibility to avoid being locked into a system that won't meet those business needs, if not current. Um, for me, and this may vary by domain, but I look for a vendor who has been doing this work for quite some time, who has a, a highly mature ecosystem, so that I know that whatever I need to do um, the platform itself will support those changes, uh, but vendors may have already, you know, the, that vendor, the platform vendor themselves, or uh, other parties in that ecosystem have created solutions. And I know that I'm able to make those changes and they'll, they'll, they'll continue improving that platform. And I can have that expectation with the vendor that's got hundreds or thousands of customers rather than one that has great new technology, but has a very installed customer base. 
uh, low income, low installed customer base. So next, as far as the implementation phase, some key considerations. So, and all of these again are the elements that I've talked about in these prior slides and just some considerations when you're implementing. And if we've addressed the evaluation stage properly and thoughtfully, these are far less of an issue to do and to do with agility. We can apply our, our current or similar to current processes, practices, and we don't have to change our philosophy in the implementation phase because we've, we've addressed those evaluation needs up front and this system we can evolve within our existing, you know, whatever framework you choose and however you approach work ag in, with an agility based focus today, this will, be, this will support that well. So for configuration, again, we wanna start here. Each system and platform is gonna have unique requirements and approaches for this configuration. And again, some are easier, easier than others. As I'd mentioned before in the evaluation phase, and this is worth repeating, so I did, we want to make sure wherever possible, if these systems offer product owners, business analysts, or, or those who are the closest to our actual customers, if they can, can do much of that work, that is helpful, far more efficient, effective, valuable uh, than requiring it through abstractions that you know, developers or system administrators have to do. For the integration uh, and plugins and modules, uh, this, this extended ecosystem, as was alluded to, they're going to require some development and or system admin support to implement, and they do cost money. That is a virtually always the case, in some cases, a lot of money. But they can not only can they be more cost effective, but they can extend these capabilities far more quickly than traditional development. Because they're part of a vendor's ecosystem, even if they cost you money, if you think about what it would cost to, to custom code that uh, additional capability or functionality, you still have to worry about future upgrade paths, interoperability with the core platform. So since they've already done that testing and validation and they've probably got an upgrade path as well, you can have confidence that you're not going to have to continue reworking that solution as you continue to extend and evolve the system itself. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, and again, Atlassian is a good example of this, a number of the vendors in their ecosystem, they're not bound to Atlassian platform version changes. They have their own roadmaps and they may be able to get a new feature or capability out as far as that integration more quickly than the core vendor. So you're not necessarily bound to the, the core systems vendor timeline. So custom development, again, the option of last choice. It's generally required. So it's not that it's bad, it's just only use it sparingly. Custom development, likely necessary when it is, do it well, but do it as infrequently as possible. Try to avoid it. When you do it, do it thoughtfully and only when necessary. Do consider, and this was referenced in the chat as well, the impacts of core system upgrades and whether this custom development that you're doing to meet an internal business need may cause challenges in the future. I've run into that in the real world where uh, a lot of customization effectively had to be scrapped because it broke the ability to upgrade completely. It was just not possible to do it. And the number of person hours required to even undo that work to make the system ready to upgrade uh, was substantial. Um, and substantial is an understatement there. Uh, let's see. Back to that last point though, it's especially the case if any core out of the box functionality is being impacted. So, you know, back, back to mind the gap, that is something to definitely be cognizant of the moment that you try to do any custom development is, are you overriding something that will break upgrade compatibility? And the vendor will tell you or that they should, and they'll at least guide you to areas to avoid. So this is my favorite and least favorite slide. That cake always looks magnificent and it's hard to focus on the, the rest of the slide here, but I'm gonna do my best. But for those of you who have been um, involved with agile ways of working for any period of time, know the metaphor of the slice of cake and the way that we do what we do in avoiding monolithic development and phase-based development is that we want a slice of the cake, not a layer of the cake that gets us something that is comprehensive and valuable uh, more quickly. 
but as with, with traditional development, we, we want to make sure that each product increment is focused on the business value, regardless of how we do it, right? So those of us, we're going to have to figure out with our team members how we do the implementation. But the same principle applies, right? We, we don't necessarily, our users don't care how you know, the, the proverbial sausage gets made. They, they care about something that's valuable and useful and usable for them. And we'll figure out the how. Whatever is the path of least resistance to get out, out there as soon as possible, that's going to be the preference. Some of this may be simply enabling basic features out of the box, as we talked about, for early business use and usability feedback. Um, it's not going to be the final version, but as long as we can get that interaction, we'll, it'll be far more efficient and effective to get that feedback and to course correct quickly and iteratively until we do have something that is usable by them and we won't overbuild and we won't build the wrong thing. And some of the stories and functionality may simply be configuring these out of the box features. So again, I know I'm repeating myself, but by design, where we can configure, that's always the best choice. We can get something out there that may well address their needs simply with configuration. As I mentioned, how it is enabled doesn't matter. All our users care about, all our customers care about is that it addresses their needs. Start small and simple, get that feedback. However you need to iterate through it, if it's through code, it's through code. Still, we wanna get those feedback loops. We wanna keep those feedback loops in place. And those principles are, you know, Again, other than the out of the box configuration, these are principles that we already use today. So it's not really that big of a shift when we're implementing and configuring these systems if we approach it this way. Uh, slicing uh, methods that I had mentioned or, or had alluded to on, on one of the prior slides. So when we were trying to figure out, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So some slicing methods to consider, again, about getting functionality out there. When you say, well, we can't just do this entire product at once, this will vary dramatically by your domain, what, you, uh, what, what, what functionality you're supporting, what business capabilities you're supporting. But these are some things to at least get you thinking about ways to slice. So by module or component, you know, do you need reporting to see that the user journey in terms of capturing information uh, is functioning properly? No, I mean, the reporting data will be there at some point. You don't need to have the entirety available. So maybe you start with whatever the key module or component is for a particular business area, and then you can evolve by feature similar to the above. So with limited or no customization, can we just take one feature and roll that out before, you know, again, we, we want to start getting iterative feedback. Um, by region, state, or country. Now, again, a lot of this is informed by insurance, some of the work uh, that Arash uh, and, and I did as part of the team in a recent prior life. Um, there are state-specific uh, changes that or, or requirements. So rather than trying to do it for every single state and the unique needs, start with a state. And by the way, start with the easiest state. So if the requirements for a particular state um, one state are, are, are far less complex and then other ones are far more complex. Um, start with whatever is simplest and then build upon that. You can also slice by user type or by role. So, and again, uh, those of you who are familiar with story splitting um, are familiar with these techniques. Some of these are the, the similar techniques that you would use in just tr splitting traditional stories if they're too big. By user type or by user role, do we need to have all of that functionality in place um, do we just start with a standard user? Do we start with a customer service rep uh, rather than a financial analyst, rather than a manager? Think about slicing. So again, it's business valuable, but it's a subset of your user base based on their role. Um, add any custom development behaviors, UI, UX improvements, any of those things, add them iteratively, um, but again, add them after. You can still slice them, but put that in the backlog once you've got the core basics up and running. And remember the COTS value is what's out of the box. We wanna leverage as much of that as possible. If we've done that evaluation stage right, which is why I spent so much time on it, then we know that we've got good value out of the box. And then our efforts can really be focused on the things that, that truly move the needle in terms of the customization. 
And also, as far as the integrations, even if you're mocking things out when you're first rolling out some pieces of the, the functionality, or this is manually entered in some cases, if that's possible, but add those things later. Get, get the, core, um, the, the core use cases done, get the core scenarios, user journeys in place. And unless they're required for core functionality, add those iteratively. Um, you know, after you've got feedback and you're sure that the core piece that you have is functional and addressing what the needs are. So some things that I would very much suggest you do in your organization does assess the needs from a functional rather than technical foundational need first to make sure from a business, uh, you know, business functionality perspective, from an operational needs perspective, that those needs are being met. There's no point in looking at the technology if, if the actual functionality of the system doesn't support your needs. Do you ask targeted questions for reference customers, as I'd mentioned, related to time uh, in person hours and effort and expense for the initial implementation, as well as upgrades? Uh, upgrades are, can be way more expensive than you'd think based on what that word traditionally means. Understand the vendor's roadmap and technical extensibility. Um, that's going to be really key if you're making a multi-year, in some cases, decade plus commitment. Make sure that that vendor is going to be there for you. What's the ecosystem? What's available via integration? What's configurable? Who does that configuration? Is it developers or sysadmins or can it be done by analysts or business or business focused staff? All the stuff that we talked about earlier. What needs to be done via code or traditional development? And for that, what languages are supported if they're proprietary? And many of them are not insurmountable, but you have to factor that into how quickly you can get something out there and what it's gonna to cost to take and maintain that. And then also core infrastructure options. That is something ultimately, once you've chosen it functionally, want to understand from a functional perspective that it meets your needs. These infrastructure options, same thing, you're, you're marrying a system for an extended period of time if it uses a database platform that you don't use or if it's not uh, well supported, I think we've all had horror stories of tech debt for database platforms that were still running on that the vendor has been gone for quite some time. At least I've been through a number of those. But that, that cascades in all of these different sort of foundational uh, technical platform questions. Just understand what options are available and make sure that they're something that you are able to incorporate in your ecosystem and that those vendors are all mature as well. And again, iterate through implementation within slices. What we've, we've talked about, again, repeating myself by design, thin slices are agile principles. Get it out there, get that interaction, and just build on that success. So some don'ts, including things that I'm sure that I've done that I just never want to do again. Uh, don't define an exhaustive and prescriptive set of requirements for the full implementation. Try to avoid, you know, so again, evolving requirements. Don't override foundational behavior, features, and functionality solely to match current processes. Again, reinforcing that you're buying a system that's been informed by a lot of different customers. It should be best practices or better practices. Look at what it has and understand why it has that before you try to override that. Don't do a big bang monolithic implementation. You don't need to as we've just covered. So please try to avoid that wherever possible. Uh, don't just call things sprint and a big bang, you know, waterfall or <laughs> waterfall based approach. Uh, we really want to deliver early and often and, and evolve what that system is and how it works and what it does. And again, don't customize via code unless you've absolutely verified necessary that, that it needs to be done because functionality is truly needed. It's not just legacy systems. Our current system does this. So our new system needs to do that. Do you? If it's a system that's been around for decades, maybe you don't need that anymore. Maybe that business need is addressed differently. Also verify that those configuration changes address the need. If they don't start talking about coding unless you can't configure it or those other elements that we talked about as far as the order of operations, this is our choice of last, uh, our option of last choice. So go through all of these and make sure that you're assessing that on a case by case basis. And then don't forget about organizational change management. This is another thing that I've seen, uh, and I'll just really, that is worthy of, of a discussion all on its own, but even if you've got business engagement and you've got a great platform, an organization is going through a material change and change is hard even for good change. 
Make sure that organizational change management is part of what you're doing. That's not just training, it's communication. It's a very holistic, comprehensive approach that we don't have time for, obviously. But make sure that that's key to any sort of rollout of these systems. Leverage those vendors' materials when possible and only customize the OCM content when there are compelling business reasons to do so.